may be popular among a certain crowd, but very unliked among a certain other crowd, was the fact that I started writing a regular column for a website called Suicide Girls, which is, uh, Suicide Girls does not like to call itself a porn website, but it's sort of a porn website, <laughs> you know. Uh, there are pictures of naked girls on the website, right? Because you're, you're a Zen monk now? Yeah, sort of. And I know, I know punk guys, and they're not very monkey, and I'd like yeah. to know more about them. But they'd come to me and ask me if I would mind writing. Um, well, first it was a weekly column, and then it became a monthly column about spiritual matters, I guess is the way they put it. I kind of felt like becoming a Zen monk was the most punk rock thing I could possibly do. I, I, I see it as very much uh, connected. I, I think that's kind of, when I discovered Zen, it was sort of like they took that same attitude to the ultimate end. <laughs> but writing for Suicide Girls made a certain segment of the Buddhist community a little unhappy, because here I will. Well, a lot of the things I do make segments of the Buddhist community unhappy. I should qualify when I say I'm a monk, because there, there are two, because uh, I am, but there are two sort of ways to become a monk in the Zen tradition, and one involves going through, uh, going through a temple, uh, to a training period where you do like, I don't know, three or seven years of, of training. <laughs> Think the thought of non-thinking, and then somebody asks, what is the thought of non-thinking? And he says, it's different from thinking. So, and he doesn't say any more than that. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And the other way is somebody who has gone through that process now has permission to make anybody else a monk in any way she or he chooses to do so. It's kind of up to you to figure out what the thinking, the state of non-thinking is. At one point, uh, this, the, my second teacher, was named Gudo Nishijima, said he wanted to ordain me as a monk. And I just thought that was crazy, you know, really. Uh, but he felt like I'd gone through the necessary training just by virtue of having done the practice for, for that many years as just part of my daily life. For me, it's sort of noticing that thoughts aren't a continuous stream. If you're actually sitting there for a long time, you start to notice that thoughts will kind of go in, I don't know, a, a good metaphor for it is this sort of a wave. It sort of builds up and builds up and builds up and becomes a thought and then it drops down again and you know when it's when it's in this low point there's not really any sort of thought there's no conscious thought and then the conscious thought sort of arises again and and does its thing and if you're really you know in trouble that that process is going like this and you, you know it's very difficult so so being a monk for me just involves doing this meditation practice every day and going to well, frankly, going to a lot of Zen retreats and things where you where you kind of live a more more what people think of as a monk's life for like a week at a time. But even even when it's going like this, there's always little periods where where the the thought just kind of stops. And what I've found to be useful is just to kind of notice that and stay with it as much as possible. Up at four thirty in the morning, and you're doing your meditation all day, and even when you when you're not doing meditation, everything else you're doing is supposed to be done with the same kind of attitude, including eating. But if you try to force it, if you try to, you know, clamp down on your thoughts, that doesn't work. You're, you're sitting there on your cushion, and you're, you're usually facing the wall, but during mealtimes you get to face away from the wall, and then people... You take turns every day within the group, so uh, everybody has a turn at being a server. Another way to explain the thought of not thinking is that it's kind of like thoughts go on, but you no longer pay attention to them. They, they, they become less important. Whoever's turned it as being a server, it's usually two or three people, come around and serve the other monks the food, and you're sitting in your meditation posture. You have to, before you get to eat, you have to do all these chants and things, and then you get to eat. Shunryu Suzuki has this line, he says, thoughts are... Thoughts are the secretions of the brain. 
the way like stomach acid is the secretion of your stomach. It's just something that your brain does when it's functioning properly. So there's no need to try to stop it. But at the same time, it's not all the rules and things that exist aren't just arbitrary. They're, they are created to try to make this practice possible. You, you also realize that the thoughts themselves, the content of the thoughts, isn't really important. They'll just go on and you know, at some, at some level you can be thinking whatever you want and still remain fully engaged in Zazen practice because the thinking just uh, is just another noise that's happening inside. So, so for me, that's what being a monk is, has been like, and you know, and also it's you know coming to Finland and doing a bunch of <laughs> talks about being a monk. That's another uh, part of the job, and and you know, I've written books about it. And I got into it because I found this practice useful, and and whatever I manifest as a Buddhist teacher is just about what. Um, about the practice and how the practice is, has influenced me and, and what it's done and, and also the mistakes I've made. In this practice you, you'll experience a lot of things and one of the things you might experience is a kind of state of bliss or euphoria or this kind of wonderful thing. But any good Zen teacher will tell you not to stick with that because that uh, that's also another distraction. Universe. With the universe, yeah. really? When you're when you're when you're with an expert, with a master. Have you ever uh, had Have you ever had sex with a Zen master? So rather than trying to aim for a state of euphoria or bliss, you just kind of if euphoria and bliss happens, you just kind of allow it, and you may you can kind of enjoy it too. It is, there's no shame or sin in enjoying a sort of euphoric state during zazen. No, I thought that they don't. Um... Oh, you're wrong. Oh. We have all kinds of sex. I know oh, okay. you, you know the Kama Sutra. The problem is once those euphoric states pass, they always pass. Then you get into this bowl. I wish I was in euphoric state again. I was in a euphoric state 15 minutes ago, and now I feel like shit. Their secret. I, I'm one of the few people who've mastered the secrets. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and and that's the problem right there. Is that that mind that says, "I wish I was somewhere else that I'm not right now." You have enjoyed your time here. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. You know, but, you know I know some. Uh, you know, secrets. Some Buddhist secrets that they don't you know, usually reveal. Any sort of euphoria you might get or good feeling you get from the practice comes from those times when you're able to drop any, any preference, any idea that I would rather be this than that. Uh, yes, but... The Kama Sutra, there's 375 positions that uh, you know, as a master, yes. I'm, I'm very adept in okay. several, mm. several techniques. Okay, but, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure know. that's very interesting, but I, I, uh, I think yeah. I have to go now. <laughs> uh, so, so ironically, if you actually want your euphoria to continue, the best thing to do is not want your euphoria to continue. Uh, and it's impossible to consciously do that. You know, because if you try to consciously will yourself not to want something, you know, it's like, you know, somebody says, don't think of a pink elephant. You know, immediately you're thinking of pink elephant.